How's it going? My name's Keelan Dunn and I am an actor. Hi Keelan, uh, thanks a million for joining me here for the Access Chats um, live from London, yes? Yet. <laughs> um, for people to find, I always say for people to find this um, in, in a decade's time, in the depths of some um, wormhole on YouTube, we're speaking in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic, so life's kind of quite a bit weird for everyone in the arts. But I suppose what I'm interested in having a chat to you about is kind of go right back to the beginning. You know, you as a kid, was it something you were always into? Like, did you know early on? Um, no, I didn't know early on. Uh, I kind of found out quite late, actually. Um, we'd always kind of done little bits and pieces to entertain ourselves and the neighbours and that kind of thing on the road. Grew up in a little cold de and fingers. Um, but it wasn't until I got to transition year and we did a musical in transition year. Um, and we went to a very musical school, so music was everywhere. But uh, we did Oliver. And... I was the artful dodger, which I wasn't very pleased at to begin with because I wanted to be Nancy. Yeah. And I was told no. And I was like, but who else am I going to play then? And they said dodger. And I was like, oh my God, that's so, it's so much better. Uh, so I did it um, and surprised myself because I was quite an introverted teen um, and surprised everybody around me. But then kind of put it on, put it on hold to go and do the sensible thing of going to university which I did for two years before I dropped out and said, no, I need to go back and find out what that was. Yeah. That thing. And can I ask it? I mean, that's, you know, that's something, I mean, did you have to do the musical? Was it something that you were kind of forced into doing as a school or was it your choice to do it? No, it was kind of like part of the whole transition year thing. If you do a photography course, you do a different language than, on, than is on the curriculum. You do a musical. Yeah. But I, mean, I suppose, like, if you're, you know, as you say, you were kind of shy teenager and kind of introverted kind of growing up, the move from that to what to probably the lead or one of the leads in Oliver is quite, like, was that nerve-wracking for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was. Um, but, I don't know, maybe it was the fact that it was music involved in it as well and... We were a very small school, like there's 150 in the school in total. Okay. Everybody was very close. It was as much about being surrounded by the people that I was surrounded by, maybe that made it that bit more comfortable that okay. you weren't afraid of making a ticket yourself because you'd already broken three tambourines in orchestra yeah. that week. Yeah. So you'd made a fool of yourself already. So um, it was a safe space, I suppose, is probably why it landed. Yeah. It's tough. And when, when you kind of before that, like, you know, through those, were you kind of absorbing a lot of, you know, like films or books or TV? Like, was, was, it, was it you? Were you drawn to that? Uh, I wasn't the biggest reader now. Everybody else in my family were, they were huge readers. I mean, my mother had managed to read everything in Finkless Library, so then had to start going to Ballymun Library. Um, <laughs> and my, Brother and sister were the same, but I was kind of, I was out, I was playing football, I was getting in trouble, I was climbing trees. But yeah. films were were kind of present a lot. There was like the Saturday night going down to the video shop with me dad and getting a movie out and we all sit around and watch that. Yeah, yeah. And then I suppose from, say, you know, you did the musical and something shifted inside you. Did you run away? Like, did you kind of go, did you kind of park that and kind of go, look, that's grand, but it's not. Like you were saying, your your family were shocked at it. Were, were they kind of shocked when you, when you came down after the art project and kind of go, wow, what was that? No, I kind of, I don't know. I think it was the fact that I thought the right thing to do yeah. was to go to uni, get the law degree, and... I don't know, I think I kind of denied myself out of a sense of, of doing the right thing rather than the frivolous thing. And that's how it was seen. Yeah. In my head anyway, you know, get your education, do the thing, become a lawyer, do all that. Um, and it was only while I was midway through that degree that I kind of went, this is not, this is not for me. I don't think I can do this. 
I mean, I found the leg. I found out what the legal system was, and I realised that's a crock of shit. <laughs> and uh, I realised how that whole thing worked, and I kind of went, "Oh, okay." And I wanted to do human rights law, and there was I just at every turn, people were telling me, "You have no idea how hard that's going to be for you. You're not going to earn any money. You're going to be, you know, disappointed constantly." Yeah because of the way it's set up. And I thought maybe there was a way through performance as well that you could, it sounds really kind of idealistic, I suppose, but reach people or touch people or, or, or affect some change through that, that maybe is not on the same scale, but you can, you can do something with it. And was that, do you think that kind of drive was what drove you to do, to, to do law in the first place? That kind of wanting to kind of touch or wanting to connect or wanting to change? Yeah, yeah, definitely. My mother had worked in refugee legal services and uh, had, had done some work in family law as a clerk. And, that, and, that. and it was kind of the way we were brought up, I suppose, is that if you can help, you do help. And, you know, we've all kind of gone into the me and my siblings have all kind of gone into work where we kind of the work goes out you know my brother's a doctor up in Manchester my sister works for a union and I do this so it's it's kind of I think it was always there within the three of us it was always put there and was that were you involved in any kind of drama society or anything in college was that kind of around you at all it was around me but I didn't get involved in it um which was weird, but I do remember sitting in it in one of the pubs with one of the girls from my course. He was learning lines for the drama sock production, and I remember kind of thinking, "Oh, I think that that may have been the very moment that sparked the thing in my head to go, oh God, Jen, do you remember? Do you remember how much you love doing that?" Um, but I didn't. I got involved in student politics and debating and and mess and, and not go to lectures and because I went to college in Limerick as well so I was f so far from home yeah. that I kind of felt you know that was my kind of go nuts two years yeah yeah um, but then you know that's a big step then to kind of to turn the car you know from that path oh yeah um, oh yeah and did you, when you left well, I suppose it's interesting but did you leave law with an idea of acting or did you leave law because of law you know was there kind of a a segue period of what next? It was a combination of the two, really. I kind of, I'd, I'd done my first year and I was a bit like, oh, okay. And then I did my second year and I realised I actually didn't have to do half as much as I'd been led to believe I had to do. So I kind of winged my second year and got better results in my second year than I did in my first year. Um, and then, you know, the reality of what the legal system is and who it's for. Mm. Um, started to sink in and I started to realise this is not for me at all. Uh, this, is, this whole system is not designed to protect me and, or anyone that they say it is. What else can I do? Oh yeah, there's that thing that's been humming away in my head for the past four years. Let's give that another go. And so how did that come about then? What happened? I dropped out. I had a large chat. <laughs> which did not go really well. Uh, and I was constantly told, you don't even know if you can do it. Yeah. You know, you're, you're dropping out of this thing. And it didn't help that my brother had just, I think he had just graduated from med school. Yeah, nice. So it was like, I, you know, they had the doctor and I was ripping away the prospect of having a doctor and a lawyer. Uh, and I said, yeah, well, you know, if I can't do it, I can't do it. But, I'm not going to continue to do the thing that is not making me happy. Uh, so I got a part-time job and started doing the part-time course in the Gaiety School. So it was like two nights a week. Yeah. Um, and that kind of gave me the confidence. That was a real, because I'd applied for the full-time course and I didn't get it. Um, and I now get why I didn't get it. I was there was things I needed to, to do, to learn, to, to get in my body before I could do the full-time course. So I did that for a year and that was amazing. That alone to just go, oh, I can do it. 
and was it a big moment like kind of realizing the I mean, I say it must have been a big moment kind of going yes the kind of the confidence to kind of move from college and then kind of you know the kind of going geez i hope this is kind of this feeling is right but then to arrive at a part-time course and kind of go oh this feels right was that kind of immediate uh yeah it was and i kind of felt kind of felt i found my my people as well um I didn't, not that I didn't like the people I was in uni with, you know, I found my people in uni as well, but that expression, that people who, who want it thing, people who say, well, the walls are actually two foot further away than you've been led to believe they are. You can do more, you can say more, you can be more. Mm. So that for me personally was also did huge amounts from my self-esteem and for me personally mm. to kind of go, oh, oh, okay. I'm not alone in those things. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of immediate mm. when I landed in it. And then from that, like how did, you know, it's one thing finding that tribe and kind of find, but then the realization of, oh, okay, I've actually, you know, developed this into something that I can kind of make a career out of. Yeah. <laughs> that came a lot later, that horrible realization. Um, <laughs> we'll go back. Prob <laughs> probably until, not until I was in full time and nearing the end and going, oh, shit, I have to make a living out of this. <laughs> and I, I was, you know, I was really lucky and I have been very lucky in that I've, there's been rare times when I've been without work. Mm. But yeah, that I, the, I think I was too caught up in just how much I was getting off it to think of, did I just give up a career in law to eat beans for a week? <laughs> one week, if you're lucky, one week. Did you go then, to, to, sorry, did you go to, directly from the part-time to full-time with that? Yeah. Yeah, I auditioned again. We had been doing, actually it was weird, we'd been doing Shakespeare in the park. We used to do that every summer. We did two weeks in the Stevens Green. Wow. For kind of busking. Um, for in the, what memorial, you know the big stone memorial in oh, the yeah. middle of the yeah, Stevens yeah. Green. Yeah. We made that, that was our stage basically. Wow. And uh, we pool our money and we go down, we walk from the top of Cable Street all the way down and go into all the charity shops and buy our costumes. And we'd rehearse then and we'd do two shows a day for two weeks in the park. And we'd mix it up. We did versions where the male characters were female characters so that the girls actually had a bloody chance to play <laughs> something relatively interesting. And we'd set them in like the Wild West or somewhere, wherever. And it was, it was that to me, I think, that to me, I think was as much of an education as anything I'd ever been trained in. It was just getting out there and doing theatre outdoors for anybody who wandered in and to make that accessible. And God knows making Shakespeare accessible is not easy. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a big thing, actually. For all that I learned in that kind of formal drama school setting, nothing compares to what you learn being out there, wherever it is, and having to pick it up as you go along and figure out where you sit within a group of people, how to do your bloody taxes when you have to do your taxes. Yeah. Walking out of an audition and going, okay, that's not the way to do that. I need to go away and think about how I do these things. Yeah. Because I think drama schools forget these things. They want to teach you a certain curriculum or a certain set of texts and techniques and approaches, but the real life experience is so much more valuable getting it wrong you got to get it wrong you got to get it really wrong sometimes yes 
I think actually Patrick, Patrick did say that a couple of times. This is like, if you're going to fail, fail big and then come back and do it again and you'll know the next time. Yeah. But it's that allowance as well. I mean, a couple of things there you said. First of all, the allowance to fail. But also that, you know, I love that phrase you used about the walls being kind of two foot bigger than you, you know, than you kind of thought they were or pushing those boundaries. But also from your first experience of the Artful Dodger to now doing Shakespeare where gender becomes not, not a thing. I mean, that's very early in school to kind of have that realization of kind of going, oh, okay, that's not, you know, it doesn't have to be that or it doesn't have to be this. And that kind of, that must be the very freeing kind of experience to have that early as, as well. Oh, yeah. And especially for somebody like me, you know, who's gone on to do so much of that kind of gender bending and playing something not as it's written or it kind of, I don't know if that came for first, if the Shakespeare came first or the, or the desire to do that came first. Yeah. Um, but it fit perfectly for me, that kind of stuff. And also that, that, thing that I kind of missed and I'll probably regret saying that now with everything that's happening and what's to come but that thing of just making it just going what have we got we've got a towel we've got a wheelie bin and we've got two bricks okay yeah. let's go yeah. you know I, I miss those days weirdly enough and I, I, and, I, and over here because you know the funding doesn't exist for the smaller theatre companies and everybody, everybody and everything kind of gets pushed towards this dream of West End and, and the big spaces and there's, there's, there's little room. I mean, it does happen in the smaller theatres, but there's less of it, I feel. And I don't think practitioners do that the same way we do it at home. Everybody's done that at home. That was the way I thought theatre was, was that, are you doing a show? Yeah. Can I be in it? Yeah. What, what show do you want to do? Yeah. Grand. Okay. Have you got 50 quid? Grand. Okay. I'm going to get a lad down here. He's got, like, we did uh, Bent in Smock Alley. And I think, it must have cost us about 100 quid to put on. We did a cabaret night. We cleared out the whole place. Now, this is before it was converted in the, in the smaller space. Uh, we did a cabaret night to raise money for everything we needed. We had, everything was done with lights. The train was done with lights. The dressing room was done with lights. We built a swing from the ceiling. We made the costumes. And we got some, bro some broken up bricks for the lads to move from one side of the stage to the other. And it was amazing. Yeah. And we did it for nothing. And it was the best crack. Yeah. And when, sometimes when I'm here and I go to see a show in the Olivier or the Littleton and I'm like, oh, you flew in a car. That's great. It's just something a bit soulless about it. Yeah, I mean, I think there is. And I think it's, I've heard that quite a bit back from actors um, who've worked a lot in the UK or who live in the UK around just that that kind of difference in the Irish theatrical, I suppose, DNA around that kind of making and kind of, you know, that part of the ima imagination which a lot of time the money comes second, which is which can be a bad thing as well, but, you know, but that thing of, of yeah, let's see how we can do the car differently because we can't afford the car. Yeah, I mean, I went to see Jane Eyre that Sally Cookson did in the little zone. And that was it. That was it. That was devised, group of people, bands. You had a guy who had a whip in his hand who was playing the dog. And he just whipped the play and just everything. And I was like, this is it. Yeah. This is this is it back again. This is I've missed this. That, that was on that was on that was streamed actually recently that production, I think, on the yeah. Oh, yeah, it was incredible. But the same, yeah, from that same kind of well. Um, can then kind of, you know, he's talking about Bent there, but like, you know, leaving the gaiety and leaving that immersion and leaving the kind of the, the madness of doing the summer Shakespeare's and heading out into the, the cold light of the real world. Um, was there a gang of you? Was there a kind of, you know, was there a kind of sense of a, of a crew going out or was it you going out? Like, because, you know, your work kind of took, there's a lot of work there quite soon. It wasn't, you know, there was kind of, how did that happen? 
for you? Uh, well, there was, I think we were a gang and we're still kind of are a gang. I mean, we're all still in touch and we're all wishing each other well. And, and you know, mm. uh, that's as much being locked in a, in a building with 20 other people for two years. Yeah. Um, and all that you go through in that. I mean, my mother died the day before my final term. But my family were my drama school mates who came to the funeral and came, took it in turns to come to the afters because they could not leave school at once. So one group would come while the others were still in the drama, because we only had two rehearsal rooms in the, in the Gaiety School. And then they'd swap back. <laughs> and they, so kind of through that you, you, you create a bond. But the other thing I think is Ireland is so, Dublin is so small in its theatre community. That when you step out, you're not stepping out into such a huge unknown. Yeah. There is a certain amount of, oh, well, I know you because you came in and gave us that talk and that thing. And I know you because I went to see your show the other day and we were chatting in the bar afterwards. And there's, a, there's, an already, there's already a familiarity there with, with people. Yeah. Um, and also, because the first thing I did was Rough Magic Seeds. So, everybody there was kind of a baby and everybody was just really new putting on a, a big show you know we were all kind of on the same level whether you just come out of trinity or whether you just come out of the gaiety or if you're two years out of whatever we were all kind of in the same boat yeah i mean that's some experience coming straight out and kind of getting into that was a caligula wasn't it that getting into that kind of history. yeah yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that's brilliant about the seed, the seed shows. They're, they're big, you know, they're kind of, you know, and was that a kind of a, an amazing experience to kind of come into that? Yeah, it was, it was a gift. I mean, it was, you know, being part of something like Rough Magic, who were and are such a huge part of Irish theatre and Irish theatre history. And seeing that there's how they support people to move them up and, and, and to be part of that process very early on um, was great. And to be working with like Conor Hanratty just at the beginning of something for them, you know, to be working with people who are just at the beginning of, when you see that in them and you go, oh my God, you're going to be it. You, this, is, this is you just starting out. Oh, because give it a few years and it's going to be magic. Absolutely magic. Um, so it never really felt that daunting. I think there was just too much excitement yeah. in all of us. You know, and there was kind of, there was, a, there was a, we were always supported. We were always made feel safe. So it never kind of felt like, we were being pushed out into anything. We're all in it together, both shows. Mm. Kind of getting yeah. to have a getting to have a go with, at the at the real thing. But I think I'm kind of and pardon me, I'm probably gonna get the chronology kind of wrong here, so do correct correct me. But I mean, over the course of the next kind of couple of years around that, I mean there was you know, not just not just getting parts with companies, there was like, you know, you played Lady Macduff in um with Selena in, in Macbeth. I mean, and that, you know, that again, it's a brilliant part in, in that play. Um, but, you know, as a young actress coming out of the Gaiety School, you know, to have those opportunities and working. And I just say, mentioned about, about, about Connor, people who were kind of, if not at the beginning of their careers, were kind of at an emerging kind of phase as well. And you know, Selena setting up her, her, her new company. They're exciting times. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the thing, I think the thing, every, I, I'd seen Titus Andronicus because when I was at drama school in first year, the second years were in that. Um, so I'd seen Selena's work um, and I'd kind of been drawn to it because it was exciting and it was different and it, it was scary in a nice way. So getting that opportunity was amazing. And then, and then to work with Alwyn and Barbara which was huge for me. I mean, I did my, I think I did my first ever professional audition 
for Woman and Scarecrow that was on in the Peacock with Alwyn and Selena. And I remember walking into the room and seeing Alwyn sat there and I thought, you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm probably never going to get this gig, but this is, this is happy out. If I can just get through this audition, just give it socks. I'm going to be delighted. So then to walk into a rehearsal room and, and be there with, with these two amazing actresses, just to be like, yeah. And then, you know, doing that so early, I think it also, it, it makes you raise your game very quickly. Yeah. But it also teaches you that, well, they taught me the importance of grace while you're doing it, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how frustrating it gets, that you never have to lose your shit. That's a great word, grace. I just love that word. I think it's just, it covers so much about what an awful lot of the world is kind of missing an awful lot of the times. Um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating because you know I'm, I'm sorry I'll ask you a question here now when did was TV and film kind of starting to kind of pop around the same time Keelan or was it kind of that was for further on down the line I was a lot further on um, I did a little gig uh, on Little White Lie that was on Little White Lies was on RTE but that was it really I didn't oh I did that What's it called? Vexed for BBC. I did like little parts, but only every f few years or so. I kind of wasn't, I had figured that I'd been, it had been decided for me that I was a theatre actress and that was what I was going to do. I mean, I didn't do anything noticeable really until Love Hay came along. Yeah, yeah, we, we, get, we get to that in a minute. Um, in, but I mean, those years though, I mean, you know, you kind of did some great work or involved in some great work in the Abbey and on national tour with kind of, with a Druid. Um, and yeah, kind of, I suppose started an affinity with, like, I mean, like Wayne Jordan, you kind of worked, worked with a bit around that, 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 that time. Um, and I think there's that kind of, because throughout your, your career, that there's kind of, there's authors and directors that kind of, you know, you have worked with Conor McPherson for, for, further on as well. I, I think it's, you know, I say in all the interviews, I mean, obviously, you know, I kind of know most people I'm kind of talking to, and you kind of go, oh, that's cute. But you, when you look back on their, on their career so far, you go, Jesus Christ, that's, that's loads. <laughs> you know what I mean? You kind of, but I think the, the, yeah, the, because the first time you kind of came fully across my radar was when you did Pineapple um, out here. Um, which is an extraordinary piece of work yeah. by Philly McMahon. But in the years up to that, there was, yeah, there was big houses and big shows and big companies. And, you know, that was, that must have been great. It was, it was. Um, yeah, I got to work with some amazing people. I mean, you know, Wayne, I love working with Wayne. And, and Wayne, was kind of coming out of that same kind of rough magic -y seeds vibe that I had come out of. Um, and then Tom Murphy. Yeah. As well. That was, that was very special. I remember because I remember going into audition for Maudie to do the sanctuary lamp. Yeah. And him telling me I was too tall to play Maudie. I don't think he ever let me forget that. He said that to me more than once as well, long after we'd done the bloody play as well. But I always thought you were too tall. To I was like, oh, yeah, I know. But you bloody cast me in it now, so you just got to live with it. Um, but I've, I've always tried to keep in mind that I had those opportunities to work with those people, like Tom mm. um, and like Wayne, mm. and to do... Christ deliver us and, you know, the reluctant tyrant so early on and to, to tour America with Druid doing Playboy, like that was a gift. Um, 
and those things are amazing that they happen, but I think there is important to keep in mind now as going, look how far I've come, but also to say, don't forget yeah. that you've had a good when it's bad. Yeah, yeah. Just go back there for a second, because I think, you know, I was going to talk about the sanctuary lamp. I mean, to be, to work with the man's writing is gift enough, but to be directed by him, you know, in, in that very specific way that he writes his plays to the full stop and to the, you know, that must have been, you know, yeah. Um, it was it was a learning experience. It 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 did it did actually. I mean, as frustrating as it drove me nuts a couple of times when when you, he'd be like, "No, that's a full stop and not a comma," and you'd be like, "Yeah, I know it's a full stop and not a comma." Just, but also to have a great appreciation for a writer's intent. Yeah. Um, and to always and to keep in mind that this is somebody who has spent however many years writing this maybe this one piece um, and that to do right by them and not just satisfy the people who are you know around you immediately mm. or just yourself you are a a vessel you are an instrument through which this stuff is 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 channeled mm. um, but yeah I this this I don't think there's anything greater than Tom Murphy stepping out from behind a table to do Maudie. Wow. As he has had it in his head for all those years. Wow, yeah. And to stand and watch him do it. And go, oh, okay. That's weird. <laughs> but I can get on board with how weird that is and how unnatural it feels because you know, and I know you know. Yeah, that's mad. And it can also, you know, because I'm not all the work, but you know, a lot of your career has been the creation of roles as well. You know, there's been, you know, a lot of, a lot of actors have talked to me about that, that, you know, it's, it's every acting gig is special in different ways, but to be there when you're kind of, it's the first time doing something, is an extraordinary, mm. particularly if the writer is kind of, is involved. I mean, and then, you know, from that, so that time you went on to kind of, you know, have a, an affiliation or a relationship with Calippo and kind of, you know, around, you know, but a pineapple obviously was, was one, but there was other work, there's with ten Mad Mary, and, you know. The, so I suppose that that piece as well. Again, you know, like rough magic. That was a scene that was really starting to to pop for for the lads. You know, it really, really was. Yeah, yeah, and they were great plays. Mm. Um, and great. I mean, Colette. I still, you know, love the bones of Claire Farrell. She's yeah. amazing. What she does, you know, she's a she's a proper hustler and grafter. You know what I mean? She really she doesn't stop. Yeah. She will not leave you alone until she gets the answer she wants to get. Yeah. And I admire her hugely for it. Yeah. Um, and she looks after her performers and her writers and her, and, and her people. Because, um, I mean, Mad Mary was such a mad experience. It was kind of like out of nowhere, just kind of handed to me. Right. Because um, Yazi had done a week, I think a week or two in the project. Um, and she was ready to pass the baton and it was, it was over, it feels like, I think it may have been about a year of my life I spent wow. playing that character. Because we did Edinburgh and then we did the national tour. And it's a very bizarre experience to live with the same character that long when you're not doing TV or film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was quite, I mean, Edinburgh is, Edinburgh is Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, but then to go straight onto that and do then a national tour, um, it made all the difference to have, to have it been sorted and looked after by Calippo. It's interesting as well, because you, going back to what you mentioned earlier on about the, the um, law and the kind of the drive, you know, there's, well, you know, there's a conviction um, about your work, which I love. Um, I mean, every actor has conviction, but there's something um, that I've seen that kind of has that, that, I don't know what, how best to describe it, but that, you know, for the characters that you play, it really fucking means something. Do you know what I mean? Even if it's the simplest of scenes, it actually really 
you know, and I'm kind of going pineapple now, but it just really, really, really means something. The normal, normative things in people's lives. And I think that, you know, I was interested in that process for you. Is that something that's, yeah, like falling in love with the character or kind of feeling that kind of um, really quasi-activism around them? Well, I think, I think it also comes from the characters that I've played, well, especially like Paula. I know Paula. I've met a Paula. And I think it's also important to me because of where I grew up, because of how I grew up, representation of, of women and working class women on stage. That there's a, there's a dignity there that I think can sometimes be overlooked. Mm. A lot of credit goes to the writing of that kind of stuff though as well. I mean, Philly, Philly McMahon knows how to write women in ways that I haven't seen in a lot of writers his age. Yeah. Male writers his age. And even some women. But Philly knows. He reminds me of Brian Friel in the way he writes women. There's a very deep understanding yeah. <laughs> from having spent time around a lot of women and strong women. Yeah. I've met his ma. <laughs> uh, and I know those women. Those women are my nanny. Those women are my aunties. Um, so when you're presented with amazing, real, three-dimensional, fierce women, the, it, does, it does a lot of the work for you. You just have to, you have, well, because you already love them. Mm. You're not going to sell them short on, on, on stage, you know? Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been a bit jammy with the women I've been given. <laughs> I really have with Mary, with... Maudie was a bit different. Maudie was... Maudie was fierce in a different way, but she was fierce. Um, yeah, I've been, I have. It's, it's, half of it is luck, do you know what I mean? It's, it's whoever's on the other side of it. Who sees um, you and, and goes, oh, I see that fit. But also, you know, you could argue, and I would strongly argue, that that's far from luck. Um, that's people recognising somebody that could do it. Um, but also, I think you mentioned Philly, and I think there's something really interesting about, I mean, obviously you've just done Dear Ireland together, you know, with, for the Abbey recently, but there's something really interesting that, you know, that you speak about him and, and his work and, and about Friel. Because I think, you know, Friel writes about women in context that he un, that he himself understands or, or kind of came came from and similarly philly and you say yourself um come from you know emerged from context where these women were just normal women and their fierceness was, was normal rather than trying to give voice to fierceness and i think that's a very yeah. that's a very radical thing so in a way i know why i love Pineapple so much, and why I love the way Philly wrote it and the way you performed it is like that neither of you got in the way of the characters. Do you know what I mean? And, and Simi, that yeah. with the whole cast. It's very, it's very easy to get, to get into in yourself around that type of context to make statements and to kind of. And it wasn't at all that, it's just real. It just it's, it's what it is. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the, that's the key to anything, isn't it, really? Is you find the truth in it and you play the truth of it. Um, and you, you trust that your audience will do the rest of it. Mm. I mean, I, I did a play a couple of years ago with the gate called Susie Stork uh, here in London mm. with a French director, Jean-Pierre Barrow. And uh, I remember him saying to me, stop moving your hands. And I was like, why? And he goes, just don't move your hands. Stop telling people what to think with your hands look the other person in the eye and tell them. You're not telling an audience, you're telling the person who's standing opposite you what you're feeling or what you want them to know. The audience will do the rest of it. Mm. That's what they're there to, they're there to watch you live. And that to me is like, that's what it's all about. And a lot of times it's very easy to forget the simple things as well. You know, you kind of 
kind of become very convoluted but those simple things of connecting with your other cast members or connecting with the words or just just doing it yeah yeah and can i tell you then i mean like again and another really really interesting part um, and i'm not sure if it was next and i didn't see this production but i saw the play afterwards but um the night alive um, and yeah, yeah. that's a great part and i think it's a brilliant and one of Connor's now I kind of know Connor from way back from, from, from kind of college and um, being in one of those very very early plays and kind of we're working with him a lot but that play in particular was something very different when it came out in my head for Connor it was kind of a different space and particularly that character there was something about about her that yeah, that was kind of an unhinging factor through the whole thing. That for the for the men around her, but yet wasn't. Yeah, her truth was really fascinating, and I think that was that was that a kind of like, and again, that was that your first time working in the UK? Was that the first? No, that was actually my second okay. second play in the UK, and also my second Connor play because I just done the Veil in the National right. the year before. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Um, which was a completely different animal uh, from The Night Alive. Uh, you know, The Night Alive was a gift. I still have people coming up to me to this day telling me how huge that play was for them. It was, it was, it was a perfect play about people living their lives and how messy lives are with the perfect cast. At the perfect time. It was kind of, it was kind of magic. And it was so, I think, as well, Connor started off rehearsals by saying, this isn't, this play isn't finished yet. It's, it's not done. Yeah. So let's, let's finish it. Um, and being surrounded by, you know, Kieran, Michael, and, and Jim, who were amazing, you know. Um, I probably wouldn't have said that had you asked me in the middle of the New York run how amazing they were. I probably would have said they're a lot of they're an absolute pain in the hole, and I wish I'd go home now because they're driving me nuts. Um, but. Yeah, and I think I remember I remember doing a Q and A in the Dummer after a run of that, and somebody said, "What does it feel like to be the only woman in this production and the only female character?" And I remember saying, "I didn't, I didn't really think of Amy as a woman within that." Yeah. Uh, I th I thought that was too limiting. Yeah. That she was just a being in the middle of other beings. I think I approach a lot of my work, maybe not consciously like that, but to not gender people and attach too much of, of a stereotype or, or, or an idea of what femininity is or masculinity is to a person and to play within that. And that will come out either through just interacting with a man as a woman or through an audience perception of mm. she's a woman playing a woman. I know she's a woman, therefore her, she is womanly. <laughs> as opposed to me forcing it. Yeah. And the thing about Amy as well was she was such an enigma and she was such a, a wildling that had come into this already messy world but a, a, an even a tighter wound mess you know, a, a better hidden mess than the boys uh, to kind of play around with, with, with kind of making her blank yeah. and just letting it seep out through yeah. interactions. Yeah, no. That's so much fun to do. And I remember talking to Dervla Kerwin actually, because she had just done the wear in the Dahmer before we did that. And, uh, she said to me, she's like, I don't know why people complain that Connor underwrites or cannot write women. And I was like, no, he just 
it just doesn't say the things. And he does that with men, male characters as well. And that's the beauty. It's the thing I love about Connor is not everything has to be on the bloody nose. It's, it's, what, it's, it's definitely as much as what's not said yeah. in that. And I think that was the key to Amy, you know, of it's what she's not saying. And she's not saying an awful lot. Yeah. So there's that beautiful moment in it where she admits that she's thought about killing herself. And you're going, yeah. And it's like that moment in the weir where that character holds off and holds off and holds off and holds off and then just says one thing and the entire landscape shifts. And it's so simple. It's masterful really to just know when to drop a grenade in a thing and watch the ripples. No, it is. And I think, I think you're right. I think Connor is an absolute genius at, at that. Um, and at that kind of living beings, creating those living beings. And in relation to what's fascinating, always kind of, you know, from this very, 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 you know, college kind of scribbled on, on the page work, it's that sense, it's always that sense of kind of, because obviously ghosts and kind of spirits play a half, play, well, and as much of the early to middle work play a huge part. But again, they were living beings within, within the play. They mightn't have been kind of manifest physically, but they were there, you know, and I think that, and certainly, I would have loved to have seen that production that night you're in because it just sounded so absolutely incredible. And again, it went all, all over. You know, it kind of popped and it went, it went er everywhere. You know, kind of New York and and was had you moved to the like had you kind of made that move at that at that stage to, to kind of go to London? That was yeah. That was the I did yeah. That was kind of my play where I was like, right, I'm I'm gonna attempt to move here now. Yeah. Um. But then I got called back again for something else. And it was with the next show over in London that I did finally make that final move. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was the Night Alive I hold very, very dearly to me. As I know, do a lot of people in this city, actually. Um, and at the Donmar. Um, everybody was involved in that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they don't, those, those ones don't come along very often. Yeah. They kind of set themselves apart for various reasons. And was it around that time then that the love-hate started to happen? Was that kind of in, in, in around that kind of area that love-hate started to happen for you? Well, love-hate, I've been, it was during the veil actually. It was uh, the last few weeks of the veil, I got a call from Maureen Hughes about this show. And I had missed season one because I'd been in England, but I'd heard about it. Um, and she said, you know, do you want to come back and audition for, for season two? And I was like, I don't know where you're going to put me in this show. I don't fit in this show. I don't know what the crack is, yeah. but I packed up, packed up all my stuff and I went home and I met Stuart and Maureen and Dave and, they told me about Lizzie and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, now I got it, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm in. Um, and that kind of started that, yeah. Because I was kind of, it was weird because I'd kind of set off on my little London adventure with the veil and thought, right, this is me set up now. I've arrived with a gig at the National Bloody Theatre with a Conor McPherson premiere. I'm yeah. off. This is me, I'm laughing. And then suddenly somebody calls from home going, hey, do you want to be part of the biggest television show that's ever happened in, in Ireland? And you're like, oh, oh yeah, go on. I could be good, so I go back there before we get to look at, like when you, like the national, obviously, you know, for your first gig in London is kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. But like, was that just something that kind of came onto the radar? How did that kind of emerge for you? Um, I had auditioned for Juno that was on at the same time. And I think Wendy Spawn, who used to be head of casting at the National, um, and Al Coomer, who was, that's a really weird relationship with Al Coomer. That was, he was assistant at the National and then went on to be head of casting at the Donmar at exactly the same time that I started working at the Donmar. And now, now has gone back and is head of casting at the National Theatre. Um, they had been seeing a lot of Irish actors for stuff and Connor was doing this and, it was, I had a very weird experience where I was in Dublin to meet Connor and Wendy for The Veil and then had to rush out of that audition to get a plane to fly to London to do an audition the next day for Juno and the Baycock. <laughs> but also, 
Keila, that sense of, you know, you mentioned with Tom Murphy, but, you know, also, you know, Connor directing his, his, his own work and that, yeah. that must be a, a gift as well. I mean, you know, they're two very different skills, but Connor's, Connor really seems to be able to nail it. He really does. He really, he really does. And it's in a way, he, he remind, Wayne, him and Wayne are very similar in the way they direct, I think, in that there's no, it's just about trying to get you to understand what the thing is. And if you don't understand what the thing is, or you don't believe the thing, then don't do it. <laughs> it's kind of, which I, I love that about Connor is like, I don't get it. What do you mean you don't get it? I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't it make any sense? Because of this. All right, okay, then don't say that. Yeah. You know, and the, 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 the have, to have a writer like Connor who, is, who, who starts a rehearsal process with this is not finished yeah. is amazing because, you know, you don't then have to wait for weeks for somebody to come into a rehearsal room to ask them permission, can you change the thing? That it's a genuine collaboration from day one yeah. of... And it's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility as well as the first person to play a role like that, that you're setting the tone for it. You know, you're, you're changing the words sometimes. You're altering things. You're setting the, mm. setting the mark for it. Mm. But knowing all the time that the guy who wrote the thing is giving you the nod or the thumbs up and saying, yeah, no, it's fine, it's great, it's great, love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, just go back to Love, Hate then. I mean, that obviously became this kind of monster, um, you know, and in the kind of overused word, but the kind of zeitgeist and culturally and whatever. But I think that part, you know, it gets kind of like the part in Night Alive, was this kind of, yeah, there's a brilliant blankness about her. Do, 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 do you know what I mean? I think that's what, that was, was so attractive and so, because it fitted, it fitted in the world, but it was like a natural spawn of the world <laughs> in, 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 in some way. It didn't really fit, you know, and that was... Yeah, yeah, no. She was, she was bizarre. Mm. Um, and I think that... That was, that was both a positive and a negative with regards to how people reacted to her. People didn't know how to react to Lizzie. Um, and I think it happens a lot with women who aren't set as stereotypes or archetypes within it, a thing that they then are only viewed in relation to the men around them. And I think Lizzie, I don't even think she did, I know she became a victim of that, that character became a victim of that, of, well, she did this to a man, or she did that to a man, yeah. as opposed to seeing actually what I read when I read that script, which, which was, here is an independent, um, creature who has appeared in this world to fuck it up. Um, and I was so excited about that. So excited about that. And then hugely disappointed by the reaction that I got. Yes, I mean, because that was huge. I mean, Jesus, the reaction for what you did was huge. Or what she did, sorry, not what you did. <laughs> don't don't you start, Mark. For fuck's sake, I'm only just it's only just over. Yeah, no, um, all, all, all joking aside, it was. I mean, you know, obviously the the program is hugely popular, but I think it looked like that. Yeah, that the public needed something to kind of bend on in a way. Yeah, which was weird because I mean, when you look at what she did in comparison to what others have. Yeah done it was nothing it was it was justified in her eyes anyway there was a huge amount of misogyny that went into the reaction to her and that was really hard to take that was very hard to take because I thought I hoped, and maybe this is naive on my part, but I hoped people would go, oh yeah, who is she? Yeah. She's doing her thing. She's taking lads out. She's, you know, going after an age. She's, 
and instead it was what how dare she interfere with these men and their world yeah yeah and i think that's really really interesting and you know for you as an actress you know and for the part because you played it so i think you played it so brilliantly that kind of uncorking that that cultural, you know, subculture, or that kind of, you know, not subculture, but that kind of, you know, underlying misogyny that obviously is, was there, and um, was in some, you know, double-handed way the best compliment that you could have got as, as an actress for, 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 for doing the part. But doesn't yeah. make it, doesn't make it any easier to kind of have to cope with that crap um, during and, and, and after it. Because I just say, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the male characters in that, Christ, never mind, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole season that was built upon a horrific story storyline of male violence towards women and you know there wasn't there wasn't the same you know you know heat towards that ca character and i think it's 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 fascinating um um and particularly because of the way you approach work as you just said there like you, you kind of that they're entities you know they're living beings and i think that's because that's what that car character was um and the way people put gender on, on top of that was yeah horrendous in a way yeah. Yeah, I remember talking to somebody about it and they were saying that um, Anna Gunn, who was in Breaking Bad, mm. had had the same reaction to her character in that she was getting in the way. <laughs> and I, I, I was disappointed by it. Mm. I think there's room. I don't think that's, that's always going to be the case. Yeah. I think there's room for, room for us to, to change that, but it just means we have to put more of more women in more varied roles on on telly, you know? Yeah. You just need to show more aspects. Yeah. But I think that's what was as 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 hard as it was in the the aftermath for you. I think, you know, to be part of again a seminal piece of work that kind of not only pushed the boundaries in relation to the way, you know, T V drama was done in Ireland and in the kind of un underworld context, but also within that there was like, you know, your role, there was John Connors, there was an awful lot of stuff in there that was kind of, if you were doing it in one context or one drama, aside from all the other things, it'd be a brave thing to do. Do you know what I mean? I think that's, yeah. I think that's an awful lot of why Love Hate still remains in, because it's a bit of a, a bit, bit of piece that people can't quite, it means something in someone's head until they go back and watch it and kind of go, oh, that's not actually what that is at all. You know, that's, and I think she lived in that. Um, so, then you're well known. <laughs> yeah, you get get out of Ireland as quick as you can. And I leg it, yeah. Um, and I suppose obviously that must have led to more TV and, and kind of work work around, around there. I mean, those over the last few years. I mean, you were you were involved in Chernobyl as well, weren't you? I was, yeah. How did that come about for you? I got a call from. Uh, I'd done. I was in the middle of or towards the end of filming The Bisexual yeah. um, in London. And I'd got a call from Nina Gold to say, do you want to come in and read for this, this part? And I went in and I read with producers, director, everybody in the room, which is quite terrifying. Um, when you're in the room with Carolyn Strauss, who's the woman who commissioned The Bloody Sopranos and Game of Thrones, and you're kind of sat there just going, <laughs> Don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up. Um, and I read that part, and I read two parts that day, and then I went back and read another part. And then when I went back and read another part, I remember Rob Stern, one of the casting lads, said to me, listen, we completely understand that the parts are getting smaller and we're continually calling you in, so if you want to tell us to fuck off at any point, fire away. Um, but once I'd read the script for that thing, I was like, I, I could just have me wipe the camera if you want I don't care I, this is amazing this is going to be an amazing piece of television I'll be in it any which way yeah. you like you know and they were it was amazing to be part of as well because they understood that mm. they understood how how each part of this machine this huge thing was important you were never just somebody who was in five minutes, you know, we went to read through and, you know, as rarely happens, we got all episodes given to us to read. Okay, wow. Um, so, you know, you could see the whole story and, and 
and where you fell in into it and how it was driving through, which I think is so important. And it, it, it drives me up the wall about TV and when you're not given the full story and you kind of walk into a thing and they're like, here are your pages. And you're like, that's great, but I've no idea how to, how to do these in the context of the, of the larger thing. Yeah. That was the thing, and you know, but it was like, this is where you sit in this landscape, in this huge story. Um, and it was so well written. I mean, knowing the story already and still sitting there and, re and trying to think to yourself, how are you going to make this dramatic enough in that people will know what's coming or a lot of people will know what's coming? How are you going to... And it, when you're sitting there reading a thing and you get to the end of the first episode and you're going, it's really bad. How could it possibly get any worse? And then you read the second episode and you go, oh shit, no, it's really, really bad. How is this going to get any worse? And you, yeah. you, it was just, it was such a joy to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really was. I, I know I'm kind of skipping back and forth and you know, you uh, I mean, you've done a lot on TV um, in the last kind of five or six, or six, six years of, of varying scales and very, but I suppose what's interesting to me is going back to, is there that young actress kind of coming out of school and coming out of drama school, that feeling that you had back then that you were kind of searching for, is that still sit, sit with you? That, that kind of, that feeling you got in, in Oliver or that feeling you got when you kind of were sitting in the pub looking, and you listen to someone learn their lines. Is that, is that still the quest? Yeah, it is. I think it may have changed, it may have morphed slightly, it may have grown and matured slightly as I have. Um, I've seen what work can do yeah. now, as opposed to hoping what it will do then. Yeah. So I think that affects how I choose what I do. And it affects where and when I do it. Yeah. Um, but I still love that feeling. And it's a different feeling now, especially like having done so much more TV in the last few years mm. and understanding where to find that feeling mm. on a film set, which is not easily done. It's It's... You know, you're not in the rehearsal room with 20 other people. You're sat on a set in the middle of Wales or wherever, you know, people flinging around you in camera and you have to find those little moments for yourself. Yeah. But I love, I love, I, I think it's hard to tell. I don't know which I prefer or which gives me greater joy. It's the end product and it's, it's, I don't think I know now until the end, till I've stepped away from the thing at the end and gone. Okay. But it's also, um, it's also killing the, like, I suppose, you know, looking at, say, when you go back to theatre in a second, but looking at your TV work, I mean, the quality of the work you've been involved in, like, you know, the likes of Catania, the likes of, you know, uh, Ghost, and like, that, that's, you know, that's work that, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a quality, you know, there's kind of, it's, it's kind of nearly like, you know, you're talking about working with Connor and working with, you know, we go on to a second, you know, work, you know, when I saw you, couple of years ago back here in, in kind of that beautiful production of Katie Roach um, but like that's there's a quality to that work that that's there sorry it was a stupid question but like there is a quality like, there's a kind of yeah and most recently I mean you know again I would love to say this you play John Proctor yes now that would like you know that must have been amazing that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life. Um, but yeah, that was, I don't, I think, I'd never worked in the art before and Jay, I don't know if Jay thought of me or if it was casting thought of me or what the story was. Yeah. Um, and it, it had never occurred to me 
I mean, it, uh, there's certain plays, you get to a certain age and you go, right, I'm never, I'm not going to play that character. I'm too old now. I'm not going to play that character. I've missed the window for that, which is hard yeah. sometimes, depending on the character. Because 10 years ago, you're thinking, oh my God, I really want to play this person. Oh my God, I really want to play this person. I can't wait for the opportunity to play that person. And you reach a certain age, you go, okay, that one's out the window. And sometimes I think for me, I realized, okay, you're not going to see me as a leading lady. Therefore, there are a lot of these roles that automatically I'm going to be ruled out of because this is not in the typical sense, leading lady face. So if somebody had said to me, do you want to do The Crucible? And in my head, I would have gone, do you want to play Elizabeth Proctor? I would have gone, why are you calling me for Elizabeth Proctor? But John, yeah, yeah give me more of those. You know what I mean? Like, it seems so obvious <laughs> now, after, when you do a thing. But also, I think it's amazing that now that, I th uh, that Kate has taken over the, the estate, that they've said, because I mean, we were doing that while there was uh, an all black death of the salesman on in the Young Vic and, uh, and uh, Sally Bloody Fields and what's his face were on in the old Vic doing All My Sons. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like a mini Miller festival going on. But the very fact that you could have people not altering them because they're not so set in a way and I, and I just but just that they've been given permission I, I, I hate the fact that people have to ask estates for anything in the first place I find the whole thing just so anti-art and so but the fact that they've gone yeah you can have an old black death of a salesman why not yeah you can have a woman play John Proctor that they've that they've gone look it's it's 2019 these have been done every which bloody way they can be done within the constraints of that they must be white they must be exactly the same sex and or gender as they are written um so it's kind of felt like you were part of something bigger yeah and also to like to just i mean it's the yard so it's never going to be which I love. It's why I, lo I love the art because it's never exactly how you think it's going to be. It's always going to be fucking bananas, but you're going to come away with something from it. Even if it's that you fucking hated it, you're going to come away with something. And that part and that play, which I knew, everybody knows the crucible, but you don't ever really know the crucible. The crucible isn't ever shifting thing because it's so fucking enormous in its scale and in its scope and its characters are so huge in what they have to do in what they feel um in in the personal dilemmas that they face and have to either ignore or overcome I mean, we were told we weren't allowed to cut that. And I remember Jay saying, well, we're going to have to cut this. And every few minutes I put my hand up and go, you can't cut that because if you cut that, that fucks with that line. And then that whole thing falls apart and you can't get rid of that storyline because it shows this politically and that socially. So you can't, so you can't, you can't actually cut that play. And I think if you try to cut it, the whole thing just falls apart. But then trying to figure out John, and trying not to play John as a man, which was something that we tried desperately to do. John is John. And if I tried to walk like a man, I'd have fucked it. If I tried to lower my voice and talk like a man, I would have fucked it. So trying to find out how to be me, playing a man, but not playing a man. <laughs> so you're playing a person who happens to be a man as a woman, but not playing it as a woman. So you're kind of in this fucking minefields the whole time. 
and you have to kind of just let all ideas of gender and sex and all that crap go and go this guy's a bit of a dickhead really and how does he deal with the fact that he's he's a dickhead <laughs> in a in a world full of dickheads but they're dickheads for different reasons i just love that um three minute analysis of the crucible which went from you can't cut a bit of it you can't cut a bit of it you can't do it into it because basically they're all dickheads <laughs> <laughs> but you're right i mean i think i think that's but i think it's that kernel and i think you know I, again, I, I didn't see it, but that sense of, you described it brilliantly, that, that kind of head melted of trying to get, not alone how to play it, but how to approach it. And yeah. know, it's not much, much about moving from the in, intellect kind of in, into, the, into the physical and into the text. Yeah, it is. But it's also, the key to it is Elizabeth huge such a huge part and I really as I got into it started to and I'll probably be slaughtered for saying this now understood how badly John had been approached before as this leading man this leading hero it's like the man is not a hero the man is a man he's fallible he's fucked up his entire family and he put his life and his wife's life at risk. And the thing that turns him to any sense in his head is her. So in my head now, the hero of the crucible is Elizabeth Bloody Proctor. Yeah. And I was blessed that Emma Darcy was playing Elizabeth Proctor. She is uh, just an amazing actress. You know, and we played around with ideas of, of what is that domesticity? between those two people yeah. who have secrets and who, who have these huge problems unsaid. Never mind the world outside and what's going on in Salem. But what is, what is the personal? What is the, the micro versus the ma that, that, that exists in the macro? Yeah, yeah. And how do you make that real? That here is a marriage breaking down because of lies and because of deceit. Yeah. And not make it just a a miniature enactment of what's going on outside. Yeah, but and also in, in the crucible, particularly not, again, not making another macro of what's going on in America and then what's going on in our society now. And uh, yeah, I, I won't keep, keep, keep it much, much, much longer. And I'm kind of realizing that you know this work I haven't got anywhere near. But like you know, around the time as well, you, you, did, uh, you worked in, in the lyric. Um, what was the play? Yes, uh, the nest. Nest. Yes. Um, so there was a flipping back and forth to Ireland, North, North and South. And then Katie Roach, um, I was like, that was before doing the, the Crucible. But that was an extraordinary, I mean, that was, she's talking about digging in the, in the non-metaphorical dirt. I mean, the, the uh, yeah, that, that part looked like a, like a joy to, to play. It um, was, it was an absolute joy to play. Um, and, and I loved the fact that it was a part that I'd never heard of before in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that, again, the, I just again the timing of the, of that play and the timing of well the rediscovery of excuse me of the, of the play um, and of the writer and the placement of that within the Irish kind of national theatre co context, but also in relation to your career in relation like right back when you're talking you know in talking about those parts in Calippo and talking about the Conor McPherson and talking about you know even John Parker which which would come down that sense of that sense of, you know, Katie's gender being a construct rather than the essence of who she, and, 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 and I suppose that brilliant playwright, because I, I, I had no very little recognition of the play as well, but from an, an older play, having that very visibly a construct, and obviously it was brought out in the, in the production, but that was, yeah, that was really, really, really in, interesting. And there's a, yeah, I, I just think that there was something there that was that was really in depth. Yeah, I think that's as much said to Caroline as well, though. I mean, Caroline kind of came to me with it, kind of going, "This is a thing. Do you want to do?" I was like, "Yeah, I'd love to do it," and and gave me a lot of space and a lot of trust 
there's a lot of trust there um, that, that I would dig out who or whatever this, this, this woman was, this child come woman. Um, and I remember when I first read it, I was thinking, oh, this is like an Irish head of Gabler. This is really interesting. And then the further I got into it, the more I thought, oh, it is on the outside. Yeah. But the inside of it is so bloody Irish in all of it. <laughs> in the people, in the way they speak, in the way they develop, in in her and she's a hard I know a lot of people say that she's a very hard character to like I've had I've heard that because she's so she behaves like an arse um, but I kind of love that about her mm. she behaves like an arse but it's not for the reason you think she's behaving like an arse yeah um, it's almost a play I'd love to go back and revisit because I, I think it's a character you could mine and mine and mine and mine and mine and still never get to the bottom of her because she is so real. Yeah, and it was kind of as well, you know, the feral kind of nature to the whole thing as well that, you know, that was, that was so beautifully portrayed in Bridget. But I think that, you mentioned, like, we talk about John Proctor, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, it's the same arse, dickhead, but human. But yeah. Human. Do you know what I mean? I think that's, um, yeah, and sorry, just before I let you go, just the, the um, just in, in relation to uh, your work, I mean, obviously you've played on big massive stages in the national and, you know, and then kind of the arts, you know, and th I suppose there's a sense there of a lot of different relationships with audiences and more recently then, you know, just last week, you kind of did the Dear Ireland uh, brilliant project in the Abbey around, you know, the COVID-19 space that we all find ourselves in. And again, working with Philly. And I mean, that must have been a really fascinating experience in this kind of, not, the, the lack of ability to kind of have a live interaction with, with an, an audience. But that was a beautiful, beautiful piece. Oh yeah, it was a gift of a piece. Absolutely. It's like you pulled it out of my own head. Like it's, it's uh, again, it's why I love Philly. Just... It was simple, it was easy, it was to the point, it was funny, but also there was a huge heart in the middle of it. Um, I enjoyed doing it. I mean, it drove me up the wall. I think it drove all of us up the wall trying to get it done. But uh, I like, I think the older I get, the more I'm drawn to, not the bizarre, but doing something different. Like whether it's doing a small kind of more avant-garde crucible in the yard or doing a monologue on a phone or, you know, I don't know if it's me coming back after having done those big shows in those big spaces to kind of go, oh, okay, I've done, I've done them and, and they were great crack, but, but what? what else can we do, you know? So I'm kind of, I'm kind of finding this period of, of, of lockdown and, and, and having to think about what comes next for theatre, very interesting to kind of, I have considerably more faith, I think, in Irish theatre than I do in British theatre in that we will find a way because we've always found a way. Um, we shouldn't always have to find a fucking way. We should be given a shitload more fucking money. And I worry that our own ingenuity will be our downfall because people will look at us and say, oh, well, you can do it for nothing, so do it for nothing. Um, but I'm kind of getting more interested in, in, in the hows, the whys, the whats, and, and the wheres, and, and and doing something different. I mean, at the moment here, faced with the prospect of having to watch a load of NT Live again, 
and whatever. I kind of want to just watch somebody I've never seen before, preferably an actor of colour, do a Sarah Kane from their wheelie bin in their back garden. Yeah. I, I want to, that's where I am now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, and it's kind of, it's amazing to watch your career evolve and to have, to hold both those spaces, you know, with you. Um, Kieran, thanks so much for uh, taking part in this. It's been an absolute joy to chat to you. Chat to you, you know, one of my favourite actresses. I could talk to you all, all, all day long. Um, but I hope to see you soon when we're all released um, yes. out, of, out of our lockdown. So thanks a million. Not at all, Mark. Thank you, love.